So another use for these integration methods is to calculate total amounts of change over some period of time, right? So let's do a very simple example and we'll kind of build up to this idea. Okay, so let's say you are driving a car at constant speed of five miles per hour. All right, you could ask a question like, how far did we go in two hours? Okay, and this is a very simple question, right? We know the answer, it's five miles per hour times two hours is 10, um, 10 miles, right? But, but let's you know humor ourselves and kind of write this in terms of a differential equation and use integration to solve it. And, and we'll kind of build up to this kind of more complicated problems. Okay, so let's say that then we could describe the dynamics of this, right? We could write down a differential equation, right? We could say, okay, the derivative of position with respect to time is the velocity, which is five miles per hour, right? Then we could integrate and solve this problem. So we could say, okay, well then the position is the integral of the velocity, or, you know, integral of this differential equation, dp dt dt, which is this integral of five miles per hour with respect to time, All right? That's just a constant slope. So the integral is just a linear function, five t plus c. Uh, how far do we go in two hours? And it makes sense to say, okay, well then our reference position would be p of zero is zero. Right, which would tell us that p of t equals just 5t, right? This constant would be zero, right? We know if we're starting at a reference point of zero, then the position at time t would be five times the amount of time that's passed, right? So then to solve this question, right, we'd look for p at time two being just five times two, which is 10 miles, okay? So that's one way to solve these types of problems. Another way would be Another method for solving this sort of problem would be to draw the graph and find the area under the curve, okay? And this is kind of the idea of these Riemann sums that we'll get into and approximating integrals with sums would be about finding areas under curves. And, and approximating these areas under curves, okay? So what do I mean by find the area under the curve? I mean if we draw a graph of this function, um, let's move that up there. If I draw a graph of this function, right? Here's time, here's my speed, dp dt, right? So we know it's constant speed, one, two, three, four, five. So the graph looks like this, right? It's just a constant, function. All right, we want to find the area under the curve across two hours. So we'd say, okay, that means I'm looking for the total amount of area under this curve between zero and two, right? So it forms a rectangle, right? So then the area is the area of a rectangle, which is uh, height five times width two which gives me 10 miles as my answer. Okay, so another way to think about these integrals, uh, at least when you're kind of having these definite bounds, like I'm integrating from here to there, right? I'm integrating from zero and finding the value at time two, right? So when you're doing an integral like that, you're solving a problem where you're asking for some total amount of change, you know, how much did this position function change by over the course of two hours? So from time zero to time two, you can draw the graph of the function you're integrating and try to calculate the area sitting underneath that graph. So in this case, it's a nice, easy rectangle. We can find the area of the rectangle just multiplying the height and the width, okay? So that answers our question there. Okay, and so let's extend this to kind of a more, a more difficult example. So let's say we're driving a car again and we're gonna check the speedometer every half hour. Okay, so we don't have a nice easy function anymore. Now we are gonna assume that, that we only know the, the speed at these discrete points in time every half hour. Okay, let me just grab this. So then let's say 
that we built up a table of our speed over time, it would look like this. Okay, so we have time versus velocity. So at time zero, we're going zero miles per hour. That's what the speedometer said. And then we looked at the speedometer half an hour in, and it said we were going half a mile an hour. We checked the speedometer at one hour in. It said we were going two miles per hour. We checked it at 1.5 hours, and it told us that we were going at a speed of 4.5 miles per hour. Then we checked it at time two, two hours, and it said we were going eight miles per hour. So we're, I don't know, we're, we're, we're stuck in traffic. We're going super slow, okay? So we could ask the same question here, right? How far did we go in two hours? Right. And so there's a couple ways to answer this question, right? We only know our speed at these kind of discrete moments in time, but we could use those discrete moments in time, right? To write down a function and then integrate it, right? We could write down a function for v of t, right? We could try to figure out, is this just a nice function of time that I could write down? And then we could integrate and solve that equation. Okay. The other method would be to just make the assumption that we're traveling at a constant speed in between these two times, right? We could just assume the speed is constant in between our, our points, our measurement points, in between measurements, right? And of course, there's other ways you could do that, right? You could assume the speed is linear between your measurements, but you know we're gonna start with just assuming it's constant in between these measurements. And even here, we have two choices, right? So between, between time zero and 0 0.5, we could assume that the speed is zero. We could assume that the speed is 0 0.5. We could assume that it's some number between these two, right? Or we could assume it's kind of increasing from zero to 0 0.5. All right, we have a lot of choices here, but our two main choices that we'll think about is assume speed on the left endpoint. So the left endpoint, I mean, the time between time zero and 0.5, we're gonna assume the speed on the left in time, so at time zero. Or we could assume the speed on the right, right? We could assume between these two times, the speed is gonna be 0 0.5 instead. Or assume speed on the right endpoint, okay? And so what do these two functions look like? Right, let me, I drew them earlier, so let me just grab them and plot them out here. Okay, so on the left, we make this left-hand endpoint assumption, right? This is our function here, okay? So here, I'm using the speed between zero and 0.5 is just the speed at zero. The speed between 0.5 and one hours is the speed here, so 0 0.5. Between one and a half, one and a half hours, I'm assuming speed two. And then for the last leg, I'm assuming the speed is 4.5. Okay, so between zero and 0.5, the speed is zero. Then between the next half hour, I'm assuming the speed is 0.5, because that was the value I found at 0.5. Between hours one and a, one and a half, I'm assuming the speed at time one, so assuming that it's two miles per hour. And then between these two times, I'm assuming it's the speed that I measured at 1.5, so 4.5 miles per hour. Okay. And then if I compute the, uh, you know, if I want to find the total distance traveled under this kind of assumption, right? So this is my speed, uh, v of t, right? Or dp dt, the derivative of the position, right? So if I want to approximate that speed. I just need to find the area of these four boxes, right? That would give me the area under the curve, which would tell me how far I've traveled, right? So this is just extending, you know, when I had a car that's going at a constant speed, right? Five miles per hour for two hours, the amount of distance traveled was just the area under that curve, right? The area of this box was 10 miles, right? Five times two. So I'm gonna do the same thing on each box, right? Between times 1.5 and two, I'm driving at a constant speed of 4.5, right? So how much do I travel in this spot, right? The area here is 4.5 times a half hour, 
or um, what does that equal? Um, my bad. I should have written this one down. That gives me 2.25, right? 2.25 miles. In this, between these two times, I travel 2.25 miles, right? And then we'll add that up with these three, right? So the total area, which is the distance traveled, right? Under this kind of assumption of what our speed looks like over time, right? So in this case, distance traveled is zero times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, 0 0.5, zero times 0 0.5 plus uh, here the speed is two times 0.5, right? Half an hour, and then 4.5 times 0.5. If I compute this out, I get 3.5 miles total under this assumption, right? So we're assuming that in between the times that we didn't measure, the speed is constant and we're using the value on the left, right? What happens if we use the value on the right? Probably gonna get a bigger answer for this problem. So let me copy this graph, put that over here. Let me paste that as a picture so I can grab it. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Okay, so then let me scroll over here. Great. Okay, we can see that. Okay, so then instead of using the left endpoint, we're gonna use the right endpoints. So between time zero and 0 0.5, we're assuming the speed is the speed at 0 0.5. And then during the next half hour, we assume that the speed is the speed on the right. So between uh, one and one point, right? So the speed is two here. And then the next half hour, we assume the speed is constant with the speed on the right. So we use the speed at 1.5 and same thing for the last half hour. So now we're using that one. So if we wanted to compute the distance traveled here, we have to use the area under this function, right? So it's the same thing, right? Between times 0 and 0 0.5, we're going at a constant speed of 0 0.5. So the area here, right, so the area equals the distance traveled, right? So this first box is 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, right, plus the area traveled when we went at constant speed 2 for a half hour, right? That gives us 2 times 0 0.5 as the distance traveled in that time period plus the distance traveled in the next half hour block, right? So plus speed 4.5 for half an hour, plus the last leg, right? The area under that curve is speed of eight miles per hour for half an hour. And when we do it this way, we get 7.5 miles, right? Which is a pretty, pretty big difference in estimate from our left-hand rule, right? When we assume that the speed was the speed on the left, we got this answer. When we assume what the speed was on the right, we got that answer, right? So it kind of depends on the assumption that we make, whether we're assuming it's constant from the left, constant from the right, and kind of this assumption that it's constant at all, right? If we made these um, linear functions, then we'd be looking at areas of trapezoids and be called the trapezoidal rule, as opposed to the left and the right sums, okay? But, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument that we did method one, right? Where we found a function V of T that matches this data, right? So in this case, this was two T squared that matched the data, right? We could still integrate and solve this to find the answer to our question, how far did we go in two hours? To find distance traveled in two hours. But there's nothing wrong with the method that we are using, and it's kind of simpler to think about. Right? We could integrate and solve to find the distance traveled in two hours, or we could use left hand or right hand what they're called is Riemann sums. When you kind of split up your function into these constant pieces and look at the area under that, that's called a Riemann sum, right? 
we could use these Riemann sums to approximate the integral and solve this problem. Okay, so let's switch over to a nice computational tool, right? Because I don't want to draw more than four boxes. It gets kind of hard to draw more boxes, right? But if we have a function, now we're not restricted by this, oh, we only know the, the function at four data points. Now we know the function for all time. So we can even find the function at, you know, these other data points, right? Because we look at eight boxes or 10 boxes or 100 boxes, right? Once we have this function, we can do these approximations to kind of any precision we want. So let's switch over to this tool here. Uh, where is it? Yes, this is the one. Uh, let me make it full screen. Great. So this is a tool that uh, is going to approximate the area under this curve, 2x squared, with a left or right sum, just the way we did it before, uh, to approximate this area between time zero and time two, which gives us the distance traveled uh, according to this function, which governs our speed for these two limits, right? From zero to time two, okay? So with four points, right? This is the function I just drew, right? We're assuming that it's zero between, uh, for the first half hour, speed a half for the second half hour, speed two for the third half hour, and speed 4.5 for the last half hour, right? And then that gave us a sum of 3.5. So we knew, okay, we traveled 3.5 miles if we assume that the speed was this constant piecewise function like this, okay? And when we use the right-hand sum, right, we assume the speed was a half for the first half hour, speed two for the second half hour, speed 4.5 for the third half hour, and speed eight for the last half hour, right? And then under this, model assumption, we compute that we traveled 7.5 miles in those two hours, right? But both of these are not the actual area, right? The actual area under this curve, which gives us the actual uh, distance traveled, right? So if we actually did the integration, then kind of solve this problem, right? So we plugged in time two, plugged in time zero, and saw, you know, what's the difference between these two times. The true area under this curve is 5.333 miles, okay? And both of these left and sum, left and right sums are, are off, right? But because we only looked at four points. So now that we know the actual uh, function, we don't have to use four points or five you know, measurements to make these approximations, right? We know the function, so we can find these endpoints at lots of different times and build better and better approximations using these Riemann sums, right? So let's just look at the left sum, right? So when I use four boxes, I am pretty off from the true value. And if you look at the difference between the shaded area and this Riemann sum, which is in blue, there's some pretty big gaps, right? We're trying to compute the area under this curve, and there's some pretty big gaps between our rectangles and the actual area. So if I add more rectangles, right, let's add 10. Now you can see that there's a lot less room between our approximation and the actual area. And our approximation on the right, this computational value, which is just the area of all these rectangles summed together, is a lot closer to our true area, right? And if I keep increasing the number of boxes, you can see in the picture, it looks more and more like the actual area under the curve, right? These little gaps between our uh, heights of our rectangles and the height of the curve is actually getting smaller and smaller as the actual computed area and the true area get closer together, right? So if I keep increasing the number of boxes, right, if I make it, you know, 51, I mean, you can barely even see it. If I zoomed in, you'd be able to see little gaps again, and the area is pretty close to the actual value. If I make it like 100 boxes, you can barely, I mean, you can't even see the difference between these two at all. There's still a difference in the actual computed area, but you know, it's too small for us to see on the graph, right? We could play the same game with the right-hand sum, right? So let's go back to our starting point. If you notice, our right sum in this case is overshooting the area, right? We're computing more area than is actually there. But if I increase the number of boxes, right? I'm overshooting by less and less each time. And my right-hand sum is gonna get closer to the true area under this curve, right? So if I keep increasing the number of boxes, I'm overshooting by less and less and less, 
right? If I make it like 50, you can see I'm still overshooting a little bit. And the area under this red rectangles gets closer and closer to the area under that curve, right? So if I make it 100, you can still see I'm slightly over in some places, but this value is a lot closer to the actual area compared to when I approximate this with four points, right? And so if we know the function, then we can make this Riemann sum approximation to whatever precision we want. The more boxes we use, the closer our value will get to the actual area under the curve, right? And so we'll talk more about, you know, maybe formalizing this process in the next video. But this is the basic idea, is assume that your function is piecewise constant, Right? When it's piecewise constant, you can find the area under the curve because it's just the area of a bunch of boxes. And then as you use more and more boxes to approximate the integral between these two points, you'll get a better and better approximation of the actual area. So here we'll do left and right together. Here's the actual shaded area, right? And then uh, the integral is the same as this kind of area under the curve, right? If I increase the number of boxes, those approximations are going to go to the actual value, right? In kind of a limit sense, right? So we'll define the uh, definite integral, which is this integral with these bounds sitting on top of there, which means the integral from zero to two. We'll define this as the limit of these Riemann sums, okay? So we'll get into that later in the next video. Okay, we'll stop here.